Welcome to a very special edition of the Attitude of Aggression Wrestling Podcast. Gates, how you doing, buddy? Oh, Gators doing well. Old Gator survived the New Year's festivities, so I'm a fresh Gator. A <laughs> fresh Gator? I'm a renewed Gator. Did you at least shower or something? Yep. Well, that, that's... that's. Old a... Gator recuperated for a couple of days, laid low in the waters, and I'm ready to buy it. <laughs> it just, just kind of popped your head up above the water and uh, look around a little bit and say, yeah, there's some... Bi- How many bitches? There are some bitches right there. <laughs> Old Gator ready to buy it. Yeah, happy New Year, Gator. Happy New Year, Big Dave. Hey. Happy New Year, Aggressionaholics. That's right. Mr. Gates, uh, back on, in the saddle for this uh, back very in the saddle special again. 63rd episode of the Attitude of Aggression. And the reason this one is special is this is a standalone episode because just a little while ago, Gates and I sat down for over an hour and interviewed the one and only Len Denton. Boom. The, the grappler. Boom. Boom. Uh, one of the one of the most well recognizable names from the old mid the old territory days. I you mean, know it. This guy has worked with absolutely everybody. Preach on, preach on. I mean, literally everybody. And and Len was so kind and gracious to just sit there and basically say, however long you guys want me to talk, we're going to talk. I mean, I had to stop the interview, or else we would have just probably kept going all night. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Len, we talk about <laughs> everything with Len. Uh, just, Len, will you move up? Will you move over here and be my friend? Yeah, you know, can you? We're not even going to let Steve talk tonight because Len, yeah. Len just took over. So, uh, well, goddamn boys, that's just not cool. <laughs> Sorry, Steve, but you've been replaced for the night by the Grappler, the Len one and Den. only Grappler. Um, so yeah, we we got this special interview over an hour with the Grappler. Len Denton, I mean, we talk about, you guys are going to hear some fantastic stories about stories I've never heard before on the web yet about, uh, you know, guys from Harley Race to Randy Savage to Ric Flair, you know, fighting with uh, soldiers, just the whole nine yards. Yeah, I mean, everything. Ric Flair, Randy Savage, Harley Race. Uh, Andre the Giant, Abdullah the Butcher. Bret Hart getting choked by a dead chicken. And his dad wanting to cook it up in the fryer later on that night. I mean, that's just awesome stuff. So we've got so much. We covered so much ground with, with Len Denton, and, and it's not going to do justice by me. And we covered the invention of the DDT. We did. Which is massive. Yes. So thank Len Denton, co-inventor of that. You all are going to hear it, Aggressionaholics. That's right. This is a good one. This is a good one right here. This this is uh, the best interview we've we've done uh, I mean, we spent the longest with, with Len and he gave us just tons of stuff to go on. So Len is going to get, of course, without question, the obligatory Ron Burgundy jazz. Of course he is. But before he gets that, we're going to get to this shot of the, the obligatory shine. Shine, shot. The shine. Don't forget the shine. Never forget the, the shine. shine. Uh, uh, it's so sweet. Welcome back. Welcome back to 2016. Yeah. Who? Oh. And Aggressionaholics, welcome back, as this is, following right about now, our interview with the one and only grappler, Len Denton. We hope you guys enjoy it. Gates and I will come back and wrap things up, give you our final thoughts on this epic interview as soon as it is done. Take it away, Ron. Hit the music, Bobby. All right, we are here tonight with the one and only Len Denton, also known as The Grappler, co-author of Grappler Memories of a Masked Madman, and uh, one of the all-time greats in pro wrestling. Len, how are you doing tonight, sir? Good, good, fellas. Hey, thank you very much for inviting me on your show. I appreciate it very much. Hey, oh. thank you for coming on to our show and legitimizing us jobbers, Mr. Yeah. Denton. Yeah, <laughs> we need as much... Hey, you know Believe me, we all started out as jobbers, okay, my friend? <laughs> yes, sir. I wrestled two years before I ever won one match. <laughs> That's right. That, that was that was in your book, and uh, yeah, we're, as, as Gates says, we're we're just jobbers, but we're uh, we're like we're, we're more like the jobbers like you were than than some of these guys out there. So, um. well, you know something, fellas. You know something. I tell you, um, 
I almost named my book um, like, uh, Day in the Life of a Carpenter because back in the day, in the old school way back when I started, <laughs> they, were, they called you a carpenter. That's what you were because you helped build the foundation that made these superstars. So that's what we are. We're not jobbers, my friend. I, I got <laughs> you. I, I, carpenter sounds a lot better. Yeah, Carpenter's yeah, a little better. better I, I, yeah. I, I Put bet you your phone, keep it. <laughs> I, I bet you, I bet you, Mark Henry would rather be called a carpenter nowadays than a jobber. So. I, I bet he would. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, <it's> true. <laughs> so, Len, let me kind of start at the beginning. Uh, your introduction to pro wrestling. So, I, I read your book, and, and I know kind of the answer to this. But for the people out there who haven't had a chance to read the book, which is a great read, what turned you on to the business of pro wrestling? Okay, I was, um, it, it, here's how it happened. I, my dad is in construction, right? And um, he, he got a job hooked up with a guy who was a pro wrestler, Tiger Conway Sr., okay? Which he had a son that was Tiger Conway Jr., which is, which is the hot thing back then on, in Houston wrestling on TV, on you know, the local channel where I was raised All right. in Houston, Texas. And so um, my dad was building a, like a carport. He had a fence company. He needed a big carport built to put his... Uh, his fence trucks under and all this. And, and, uh, I was, excuse me, I was doing, um, I was running track, playing football, playing baseball, doing all the stuff you do in high school in Texas, you know? And, um, I was an athlete and, um, uh, I went over to help my dad on the weekend and this tiger senior seen me and goes, Hey, you know, you, you look like, uh, you look like my son did when he started, uh, you know, you might be a hell of a wrestler. So that's kind of where it started at. Uh-huh. And I didn't really think that much about it. And then my dad took me to the wrestling matches and I got intrigued by watching them, you know, going live to watch shows. And it just went from there and it snowballed and from one thing to the next. Before you know it, I was getting trained. <laughs> yeah, and speaking of that training, your initial training was with Joe Mercer, who, uh, according to your book, told you he would gladly take your $3,000, but you would never make a dime yeah. in the business. And and you basically said, screw it, I'm going to do it anyway. So. I'm kind of wondering, what was your thought process? What, what got in your head to say, you know what, I'm going to do this anyway? Because that's, that's a tremendous story there. Well, here's what, here's what happened. When, I, when Tiger decided, Tiger Conway Sr. says, hey, you know, you could be a, you might make a good wrestler. So then he said he didn't have time to train me, right? Right. So, I, you know, as a kid, I didn't know anything about opposition. I didn't know about outlaw groups. I didn't know about, you know, Houston, Texas, Paul Bosch was the mainstream NWA thing. Right. I didn't know the difference. You know, I walked in this thing. So I went over on the Mexican side of town and they were training guys, anybody. So I joined in and <laughs> for two weeks I trained with them. <laughs> and all of a sudden they go, Hey, you know something? They had me doing cartwheels and doing all that lucha stuff, oh. man. I wish I could do it now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Me and too. Go, okay. In two weeks, they say, you're ready for a match. So I called up Mr. I, my, my dad called Mr. Conway and goes, Hey, you know, Lenny, these guys training something. He goes, who did? Well, he got pissed off. He got mad, right? He <laughs> you know what? You tell him to come down to the Coliseum, and I'll work out with him in the morning, okay? And I'll show him he knows nothing about wrestling. Well, I went down there, but thank God Tiger was too old, and I was in really good shape, okay? <laughs> I was about ready to go to college, right? <laughs> yeah. he, tried every way, he tried every way he could to stretch me, but he couldn't blow me up because he get me tired. He finally just said, you know what? Here's the deal. I don't feel comfortable training him. He's never making a business. Tell him to stay out of it. He told my dad that, right? Uh huh. Right. So I got mad. I got mad. So okay, I told my dad, you know what? I don't understand these guys. I don't know. I'm just trying to be a wrestler. They, you know, forget about it. I don't want to do. It. I'm gonna play baseball. I'm gonna play football. I'm gonna, you know. So uh, two weeks later, my dad come up to me, and he goes, "Here, and get it." Of all things, back in the day, they used to have like. Um, uh, what was that? TV guides, right? Right. And he goes here. He goes on the, an ad on the TV guide was Joe Mercer's wrestling school. <laughs> well, they had, a, they had goes, an ad. This, this, <laughs> yeah, this is how it happened. This guy's got a wrestling school. Okay. He said, "Well, you want to give it a try?" I go, "Dad." I, and he says, "Come on." I said, "All right, one more time, I'll try." So I went over, and when I sat down in front of Joe, he goes, "Well." He tells my dad, he looks at me, he goes, well, he's five foot 10. I can make him wider and make him thicker, but it's a big man's business. I can't make him, I can't make him taller. I'll take his, I'll take you $3,000 kid, but you'll never make a dime in this business. That pissed me off. Even worse. <laughs> I go, I've been through all this now and you're going to tell me I ain't good enough. I said, okay, well, let's give it a try. My dad goes, you sure? I said, yes, sir. He said, then pay the man. <laughs> and 
<laughs> Thank God I, I called it right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you're you, you're told you never succeed. You you pay yeah, three thousand off. Me of, far as you can, brother. Yeah, yeah you, you you pay three thousand off a TV guide ad. Yeah, yeah, speak yeah, of yeah, yeah, speak of long speak of the long shot. Yeah, that that's awesome. No, no kidding, man. Yeah, no kidding. It was like a shot in the dark. <laughs> that's awesome. That man. that's that's just incredible. I mean, what great determination! And that that was one of the parts early in the book that just grabbed me, and I said, "Wow, th- this guy just basically is like screw you. I'm going to do this anyway." So I, I love that story. Um, according- yeah, I was always I noticed it in life. I was always the type. I've always been like this. If you tell me I can't do it, hold on, brother, because I'm gonna figure out a way how. <laughs> <laughs> That's, Somehow, some way. That's a great. Know? That's a great lesson for a lot of people to learn, Len. Well, you did have uh, assistance along the way, according to your biography. Uh, Abdullah the Butcher oh. uh, gave you some great oh. advice by having you write a letter to uh, the great uh, Dory Funk Jr. Uh, can you tell the yes, aggressionaholics listening to this interview right now that story and perhaps offer up some memories oh. of Abdullah the Butcher? Well, see now. Okay, now, it, it, everything didn't go roses right off. I finally made it through the training, right? Right. <laughs> and, I, and, and I got booked in Amarillo, Texas, okay? Me and a guy named Gary Young. Uh-huh. And so we go to the first TV to wrestle, and uh, you got Cyclone Negro there, 360 pounds. You got <laughs> uh, Sweet Hanson, he's like 340 pounds, six foot six. All of them are six foot seven or six. And there you, you are, five nine. Business. I don't know what. I don't know what Abdullah weighed. I mean, they probably weighed him on the on the uh, feed store uh, scales. They couldn't even put him on a regular scale. Just take him to the you know truck. I mean? Take right. him to the truck stop. Put him on the scale. The truck stop, exactly. So, yeah. and so I got there, and uh, and uh, Art Nelson was the booker, and he was a great big guy too. Okay, and um, he told us on TV. He goes, "Hey, Gary Young's wrestling today, and you're not wrestling today on TV. You're too small." I'm like, "Okay." And so uh, Gary Young wrestled, and he wrestled Abdullah, and Abdullah, Abdullah laid his head wide open. I mean, he, he initiated him right off the bat, okay? okay right. <laughs> he christened him. Yeah. Oh, they christened The next night, oh, that, uh, that night, or the next night, I went to Hereford, Texas, which is 50 miles away. It was my first match. I was supposed to wrestle, of all people, Sputnik Monroe, <laughs> but he got drunk and didn't show up. <laughs> so, Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, and it's an art, art book me with him, the booker, Art Nelson. And I'm telling you, folks, he took me down. We went 20 minutes through for draw, draw right? Uh-huh. He took me down, and I never got on my feet the rest of the match. <laughs> he run my face in the mat. He cross-faced me. He amateur wrestled me. Everything just to humiliate me, okay? Yeah. And so, and so like, two days later, he calls me in, and he goes, Hey, listen, first of all, you're too small. Here's your two weeks notice. Here's your week's notice. Right. And let, let me go. And I go, what? I mean, I done paid $3,000. I done went through all this hell. And yeah. now this guy says, I'm tall. Now I got to go home. So I, he gave me a week's bookings. And I told him, I said, well, look, it's this year I'm refereeing. And the guy trained me, Joe Mercer, says, you know, never referee. You're a pro wrestler. I trained you to be a pro wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know no better. And I went, hey, all right, sir. I'm not a referee. I'm a referee. He goes, you know what you can do with that booking sheet? He said, I gave you some uh, refereeing jobs to give you some extra money to get home on. Or you can take it and wipe your ass on it and go home now. I <laughs> 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 have a lot of sympathy for you, you know? Yeah. So I go, yeah. I said, I guess I'll go ahead and work those shows. Yeah. And so uh, the last show of all things, guys, you're going to believe this. Albuquerque, New Mexico, right? It's uh-huh. like uh, 200 miles from Amarillo. And up in the mountains. And so I got my car, and I'm going home the next day. I got my car, I'm coming back, I'm driving Abdullah. Abdullah's laying in the back seat sleeping. This is me driving. He goes, hey, hey, boss, hey, baby, hey, baby, hey, baby. On the way there, he goes, hey, baby. When we get to Tupincurry, which is like halfway, he said, there's a buffet, stop with me eat. Right. <laughs> I'll be taking a nap back here. So I'm chauffeuring Abdullah. <laughs> I swear, before we got to Tupincurry, I seen a sign of Tupincurry two miles he taps me on the shoulder. He can smell it laying back there. Oh. <laughs> baby, don't miss the buffet. Don't miss the buffet, baby. Yeah. <laughs> so I take him there, okay? And then I'm driving back and blow the engine in my car, okay? 
And so we, and we barely put in the MRO. This barely can make it. I was like one cylinder left in the car. And, like, and I dropped that dude off. And the, we had plenty of time to talk. We are going like three miles an hour for the last 50 miles, right? <laughs> and, so, and so we put in his, where his uh, place was. And, he, and that's when he told me, he goes, hey, I told him what happened. They told me I'm too small. He goes, you know what? Art Nelson don't own this place. He goes, you're a good kid. He goes, write a letter to uh, Dory Funk Jr., but seal it so Art can't open it. And when you fit, before you finish up, take it over to Art or whoever's in the office and give it to them and ask them to please get this to Mr. Dory Funk Jr. And I wrote in there, Mr. Dory Funk Jr., thank you very much. I was, I was humble as I could be. And so if there's anything, any chance, anywhere you might send me to help me in my career, I thank you for the chance in Amarillo. Please, please, here's my phone number. So I left my phone number to my dad's place and my mom and dad's. And so... I had to borrow money. My dad had to wire me money to get my car fixed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm waiting on the motor to be fixed. It took about three or four days. They got it fixed. So I got my car fixed and I stayed with him over uh, on Monroe. He's trying to get me booked in Tennessee in different places. And he couldn't get it done. He tried his best though. But, um, so finally I got my car back and I, I called home and said, dad, I told my dad, I called my dad. Said, he said, why didn't you call home uh, last year? I said, well, I've been trying to get my car. And he goes, Hey, you need to hurry back, Chris Weiss. He goes, Dory Funk Jr. called. He said, in two weeks, you're booked in Louisiana for Bill Watts. Wow. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm like, well, you kidding? He goes, no. I go, I'm on the way home, man. <laughs> come on over some new tights and headed to Mid-South, baby. Talk <laughs> about, man, talk about from the outhouse to the penthouse real quick. You just yes. broke uh, broke rank and went right up to Dory Funk Jr. That's amazing. Yes, sir, buddy. Yes, sir. That's Sometimes amazing. Got, I wouldn't know do that unless I do what told me to, though. Wow. I just went on home. Aggressionaholics, aggressionaholics, pursue your dreams. That's right. That's the yes, that's a, the the <laughs> motto of this interview. So speaking of Bill Watts, um, there's a lot in the book about Cowboy Bill Watts, and and you know a lot of the modern fans think you know that John Cena is this polarizing figure, but you know for us older school wrestling fans like myself, Watts might be even more polarizing than Cena is. And uh, Whew, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some people love him, some people hate him. Um, what are your thoughts about Watts and the impact he had on the grappler actually coming in, coming to being? Well, here's the thing about Bill. Bill was hardcore with guys, and he was from the old school. And he and and I know that. And a lot of times I couldn't stand it. You know, it's like he'd work the hell out of you, okay? And you know, he'd fly in with his plane and go, "Hey, on TV, we've been driving all night." He flew. We had like two hours of sleep. He go, listen, boys, I want to see assholes and elbows or your ass is fired out here. I had a long trip too when he flew his charter plane, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like two hours and we've been driving all night. So, well, okay, Bill. He was kind of like that. He was hardcore. If you got hurt, you worked anyway. Work around the injury. What kind of wuss are you? Let's go. Spit on and get back in the ring, boy. <laughs> That kind of thing, right? Rub some dirt well, in you. Get, get back in there. on in the ring, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you this, guys. He had a hell of a knowledge for wrestling. He had a hell of a knack for TV. He knew how to draw. He knew how to use talent. And he knew what he was doing out there. You know what I mean? He wouldn't have had such a great territory. You know? And uh, so I give him credit for that. But, um, you know, just because I didn't like everything about him, you know, I'll tell you one thing. If it wasn't for Bill Watts, the grappler never would have been here, too, because he, he Buck Roby booked me in the territory he was booking, but Bill seen it, and Bill was going to let me go at first, and he goes, I've been there about a month, and so he flew to Shreveport, especially just to watch my match with Paul Orndorff, okay? And he said, okay, and they come over, and he told me, and they told me to dress him, Jerry Escher, the referee, said, they want you to go 30 minutes to a draw through with uh, Orndorff. And I said, okay, in the Shreveport, Louisiana. And he said, Bill's watching this match. You better kick ass, Lenny. I looked down on the stage, and there was Bill. Well, Orndorff, thank you, good Lord, nobody knows this. He snuck down, which he could have got fired over this easily. He snuck down, and he goes, hey, Lenny, Bill's down there. And he said this. He said, this is going to determine whether they keep you and put the North American title on you or they let you go. He said, Bill, I said, listen, Paul, you let me call the match. Just keep your ears open, your mouth shut, and let me win or lose my own career here. Yeah, he yeah. said, "Okay." And that's and uh, two weeks later, I I beat DiBiase for the North North American Heavyweight Title. Thank the good Lord. Right now, now <laughs> were you a face or a heel back then? 
I was a heel. Okay. I was a and, heel. And, and Orndorf, Mr. Wonderful, he was a face. And, and, and Watts, I knew, was yeah, a... He was a baby face back yeah, then. He, he was, was a, a ball on the... Yeah, and, he, yeah. and Watts was a stickler for no no crossing over between baby faces. Oh, it, he called me to fire him instantly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you want the total kayfabe. You know what I mean? Right. So, so I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing. <clears throat> when he gave me that North American title, we're in the dressing room like two weeks later in TV. And he goes like, this, hold on, guys. Listen, everybody listen up. He goes, Lenny, grappler. I said, yes, sir. And I'm sitting there with Dick Murdoch, right? Me and Murdoch were good friends. Right. Both Texas, right? He goes, hey. He says, I know you like to run around with that Dick Murdoch there, that redneck. Y'all go to the talk every night after the matches. He goes, you got the North American heavyweight title. That's the biggest belt we got here. He goes, if you go out there one of the bars and get your ass whooped by one of the rednecks, consider yourself fired. <laughs> That's, yeah. Don't yeah. even come back. Don't even come back. And, and I go, and so I go, Bill, don't worry about it. I got a boss. I, it's okay. He's, he's been, remember that? Bill walked off. <clears throat> I looked over Murdoch. I said, hey, Dickie. I said, Murdoch, I said, hey, I wear a mask. Help me whoop my ass. I ain't going to know who are whooping anyway. He goes, I'll stood your ass off, boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hard, yeah, I said, hard. You probably wouldn't if I will. He said, you ain't getting away with it if I can't. <laughs> it's hard to maintain kayfabe if you got your ass kicked by a redneck in the bar the night before. And I've been there. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you're supposed to be a, a, a representing a company. You're supposed to be a champion. You go out there and get your butt whooped by some redneck. <laughs> They don't look too good for the company. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, your, your book has a, a many examples of, of the you know fan... Uh, we'll call it fan interaction getting a little bit too uh, too much. Like uh, when you were you and Ric Flair were uh, the guys on the army base that challenged <laughs> challenged Rick to a fight, and the car the car broke down, and Rick was just like just pissed oh, off. Was, of, oh, he's crazy. Rick was going nuts. He threw his jacket down. He was jumping up and down. He's screaming trying to get the guys to stop fight. <laughs> they wouldn't fight us. <laughs> they had more fun laughing at us and throwing stuff at us. <laughs> hey, uh, but. Oh, uh, when I'm trying to change the tire on my car. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Hey, uh, real quick, uh, back to uh, Cowboy Bill Watts. You say that uh, if it weren't for Cowboy Bill Watts, uh, the grappler wouldn't exist. Now, I know, obviously, uh, that you know he booked you, and uh, he gave you that limelight a little bit there. Uh, but did Bill Watts, do you mean that he also influenced your style of wrestling? Because I was watching your matches uh, before this interview, and um, I know, yeah. uh, you know, me and Dave uh, have seen some things on Bill Watts where he's kind of a stickler on how he wanted the matches. Like, he didn't want guys coming off the top rope. And I see that you kind of use that traditional style of wrestling. Is that a result of, uh, of Bill well, Watts? Here's the, one, yeah, well, here's the one thing with Bill. Yeah. When I worked in Mid-South, okay, you had the, there was the hot angle was the free birds with junkyard dog and all that stuff, right, going on. Yeah. And so... Now, Bill was a sticker for it. it says pro wrestling on the marquee. At the top of the marquee, at the building, it says professional wrestling. So the guys like in the angle with Freebirds and with Junkyard Dog and all that, those guys would be called the furniture movers. They go 15, 20 minutes, and they use it out on the floor, the tables, the chairs, and all that. Right, he furniture said, movers. Huge furniture movers, that's what we call them. He said, like Abdullah and Bruiser Brody, you know, Stan Hansen, guys like that. Right. He says, hey, Lenny. Your job is every night to go out there and give me 30 to 45 minutes of wrestling and give these people wrestling so they know they've seen a pro wrestler when they leave here. So that's what I, that was my position in the company. And so I had to go out there and get that time, and it had to make sense, and it had to have, you had to have some psychology with it. You had to keep the crowd entertained at the same time, you know? Yeah, of right. course. So you learned all kinds of different matches and different things. And I bet, like I asked a guy, at TV, we're doing TV Saturday, yet, this past Saturday, right? Right. And so he comes out of the ring with us. And, now, he's on a TV match. He's only got seven minutes to go, right? Right. He came. He went two minutes short. <laughs> so when he come back, the director guy asked him, brother, did you get a cue from the referee? Uh, did, he goes, no. He goes, well, why did you go? Why did you take it home? He goes, oh, I just run out of stuff. <laughs> I went off. I go, come here. <laughs> Jesus. I said, you went out of Broadway? He goes, no, sir. I said, you haven't won 45? No, sir. You haven't won 30? No. I go, well, if you ever done anything like that, you're going to tell me you're a pro wrestler, a professional wrestler, and you can't get seven minutes, dude? Yeah, put him in a... Go, I, went, I went crazy on him. Put him in a headlock <laughs> and sit on him. Yeah. Put him oh, in a headlock. 
four you. <laughs> you don't know a figure four? You can't lay in a figure four for a couple minutes? Come well, on, man. Go out there, they'll sit there and go like this. Okay, I'm going to do this, 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 that, this, that. When they run out, they don't know what to do. Man, that's rough. Okay, you yeah. can't just diagram. It's called working. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway. Well, no, there, there's a there's a definite difference between pro wrestling and sports entertainment. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I do agree with that. Yeah, and, and that that's that's what yeah. that sounded like. Somebody being a sports entertainer, and not a pro wrestler. So, exactly, boss. Exactly. Yeah. So let me ask you about the grappler coming into being, and I know the the name grappler came from Don Carnoodle. And uh, yes, it did. Yeah. What <laughs> what are your memories about that whole uh, that that gimmick coming to pass? Well, here's what happened. I'll tell you exactly how it happened. You know, like I said in the book, me and Don Carnoodle were riding down the road, and we're just talking like friends. And, you know, he's a pro wrestler, I'm a pro wrestler. But we, we neither one wear the mask. He said, Don tells me, he said, you know, one of these days, I mean, I like to wear a mask, and, and I like to call myself the grappler. I said, why do you want to call yourself that? I think he said in Greek it means wrestler or something, you know. He goes, I like it. I think it's because he was a good, he was a Greco-Roman wrestler, you know, in college and all that, you know? Right. And so we're kicking it around. I said, well, I wrestled in Atlanta before I came here and I wore a mask. I called myself the challenger, but I just got the hell beat on me every day on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're ta- that's how we're talking, you know, this conversation. So the next week I was booked in Norfolk, Virginia. And, um, so I, I come, I went to work out the gym that morning and I was coming back, went to eat and was coming back down to the hotel walking down the hall and uh, Gene Lewis was at his door open and this for cell phones and all that business. Right. Mm-hmm. And he goes, Hey, he said, well, like, Lenny. he said, Lenny, come here. I come in. He's on the phone. He goes, I'm talking to Buck Robley long distance in Louisiana and Baton Rouge. And he's a booker for Bill Watts. And uh, I didn't know who Buck Robley was. He's the, I knew he was a wrestler, but I never met him. He goes, he's a booker for Bill Watts in, uh, in, you know, mid South. I go, okay. He goes, he wants to talk to you. So I got on the phone with Buck says, Hey kid, he goes, uh, I understand you wear a mask. He said, I'm looking, I'm looking for a top guy to push here. You know, and really make some money and push hard. And he said, uh, I'm going to put that load of boot thing on him like Dr. X. And I was I was there when Dr. X was there when I was a kid. Right. So yeah. I remember the gimmick, right? And he goes, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. He goes, oh, yeah, you remember Dr. X? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm going to do the same thing, but I need a different guy. I need a wrestling heel. We got the free birds and junkyard dog and furniture movers and all these guys fly all over the place, in and out of the ring, tables and chairs and all that bullshit, and they blind each other. He goes, well, I need a guy can wrestle his ass off. I go, well, I can wrestle my ass off, Buck. He goes, okay. He goes, that's what I heard about you, kid. He goes, um, so what do you call yourself? I went, uh, and I thought of... I thought I called myself the grappler. He goes, oh, that's a good name. I like that. <laughs> and Don, Don Canoodle still tells me, you owe me residuals, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> All these years, you've been stealing my name. <laughs> oh, man. You are, you're the guy who wears a mask. Come on down. Yeah. Hey, what are the biggest... <laughs> yeah, you know, a career of wearing that, you know, you mostly wore that silver and black uh, mask of yours. Uh, what, are, what are the biggest pros and cons of wearing a mask as a wrestler? You know, you see mostly Lucha Libre guys yeah. do it nowadays. Back in the day, you used to see you know, guys cross over with it. What are the biggest pros and cons uh, in your career of, of, of that mask? The pros of it are that when you take it off, no one knows who you are. Right. There you, you know? go. <laughs> Even, you know, locally and, you know, very seldom somebody picks out who you are unless you make it obvious you're a wrestler. Yeah. Okay. And um, the, um, that the pro, that's the pros of it. The cons of the thing is when you go in the ring and have a match and when you go to sell a punch, or drop kick or anything you do, you have to know how you have body English because you can have no facial expression. Yeah. And there so you if go. you don't know how to use body English, it looks weird, you know? Right. Yeah, indeed. And so I don't, you know, that, that thing. Well, yeah, I mean, you were mentioning Flair earlier. Flair was a master of that. You know, just the expressions he'd give in his face when someone would put a yeah. lock on him or grab a hair, he'd do the, ah, and you'd see it in his face. So that, that, that's a, that's oh, a yeah, really good. Though, yeah. Yeah. So are there um are there any masks? And all that's gone, you got to do. Have you ever watched uh, Bill Eady, the Super Destroyer? Yeah. A mass superstar. I'm sorry, mass superstar. Right. You ever watch his body English? He's very good at. It. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, are there any mass superstars around today who you think are really exceptional? Uh, the only one I would say um, is um, well, as far as. Um, 
Uh, it's that kid from in WWE, a little Latino kid. What's his name? Uh, oh, Kalisto. Oh, uh, Kalisto. Yeah. Yeah, and then the of course uh, Mysterio. You know, right, right. Mysterio. I mean, gimmick. I mean, he's over like big time. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. I got you. So let let's talk about promos because you were very good at at doing promos and 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 you didn't start yeah. off that way. You you learned promos from. Oh. What, you learned promos from watching your dad cut a promo about Bugsy McGraw in the Truckers Union, <laughs> and and then wow. and then um, you learned a lot from the one and only Ric Flair. And what do you think makes Flair one of, if not the best ever, at cutting promos? Well, uh, what makes him the best is Rick. Is uh, he, what Rick does is it's always easy if you're telling the truth. Okay. So yeah. Rick really does believe that he is the nature boy <laughs> and he is the wealthiest guy in town. He has the diamond rings and all the pretty girls. And he, I mean, that's what Rick was. He lived the life. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And so it came easy for him to do that. You know what I mean? But he was just from boy and he had the gift of gab. You know what I'm saying? Right. Some people don't. Like when I first started, I was scared to death. Okay. But then I learned, here's the one thing I learned. Okay. My dad taught me this. Cause he goes, he goes, Lenny, he goes, you notice whenever one of the rookie guys go, this is in Atlanta on channel 17. Right. He said, do you know when one of the rookies go to do an interview on TV, everybody crowds around the monitor to watch. Right. Yeah. And he said to listen, right. What he's going to say, how he's going to do. But if Brody goes up there, or uh, Flair goes up there, you see people walk around bullshitting, horse ass and doing whatever. Because they already heard it a hundred times, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, some people are listening, some people listen, but 90% of them are just going about their own thing. He said, you know why those people are listening to that rookie, that new guy so hard? I said, why? He goes, they're trying, they're hoping, he, they won't see him mess up. So they won't, he won't take their place. Right. They want to see, they don't want to see him do good. They want to see him mess up and laugh their ass off. <laughs> don't give them that, kid. Don't give it to them. You got your rent, your bills. And without talking on that TV, you'll never make the money you're supposed to make in this business. Right. So until you learn that, and rather I had to suck it up, get rid of that fear, and look at that camera, that red camera, that dot, and think about my dad and go to town. I still do it to this day. <laughs> was that, <laughs> was that when I go out, every promo, I think about Pop Ed. There you go. <laughs> I go, hey, you boss, man. <laughs> See you in the what we're doing right now, I said before you guys came on. There you go. Well, that that's <laughs> good guarantee. practice. So, like, is that the most important thing you learned from Rick was uh, just to be yourself and be truthful when you're cutting promos, or, or what? What else did he? What's the best thing he taught well, you well, about that? Rick taught me this way. I mean, my dad taught me you got to be a man, get out there and forget about it, and do things, do it for you and your family yourself. Okay, but Rick said, "Hey, there's different type. He's a professional." There's different types of energy. A lot of guys say you just go over and scream. <laughs> you have to have peaks and valleys, okay? Are people going to turn the channel? Oh, of or course. Turn the thing down? Yeah. Okay? Some guys just scream all the way through. Some guys talk too low. You have to have peaks and valleys in your promo, right? Uh -huh. And then you go, okay, a cage match is a totally different interview than a regular. I'm just guy here, generic interview. I'm just not coming to Florida or wherever I'm coming in at. That's a generic promo to get yourself over. you got to have a three-minute one. That's what Fred taught me. When you do a cage match, you got to have a three-minute one. That's what we did three-minute ones back then, not 30 seconds and one minute. <laughs> right. And uh, everything you had to have it in line. You had to have all that stuff as a pro together. And Piper taught me a lot as well on doing promo. Yeah, uh, Piper. After Rick. He was one of the best. Yeah. What do you think one of the best. And, and think, you know, Piper taught me this. I used to ride with Piper. Somebody go, Lenny, get my pad. Write this down for me. He had a pad he right now. We had a we carry a uh, walkie-talkie. We put stuff on. And always try to hit current affairs, current things going on today in the news. Not the same old thing. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you don't stay current with your stuff and then write it down. And don't be ashamed to write it down. Don't be ashamed to practice in front of the mirror. You know what I mean? It's just, you ain't, nobody's born with this. Oh, you know of course. I mean? Of course. You teach yourself. Sorry. So that, a lot of guys think, oh, they, man, it's like, God, that guy, I can never be that good. Yes, you can be that good. If you want to be, you know, you just got to find your swagger. Yeah. That's it, boss. That's it. You just got to go out there and do it, man, and get it down. Get get the right formula, though. What do you, you know? Like, here's what Ernie Ladd taught me. Yeah. Ernie Ladd taught me, he used to go like this Lenny, what what makes you perfect, son? So, him being a 
you know, seven time all pro football player and seven and a pro athlete, right? Right. Yeah. I said, well, Ernie, I said, well, Ernie, practice makes you perfect. He goes, hell no, you're wrong. He <laughs> said, perfect practice makes you perfect. You can practice something wrong your whole damn life. <laughs> <laughs> I go, you know what? I never thought of that. He's right. That's, you know? that's very true. What do you think of uh, Macho oh, yeah. Man Randy Savage? Here we go. <laughs> yeah. No, what what do you think of Macho Man Randy Savage as far as his ability to cut a promo? My, you know what? He had his own unique thing. That's what's so great about Randy. Right. You know what I'm saying? Nobody else done that, so it was okay. I mean, if he was doing something everybody else done, it would be crap. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, of course. Right. But, I mean, Macho Man was a little out there for me. He's a little... <laughs> I, know he's, <laughs> I mean, we got along and everything, and we had good matches. Okay, he's a hell of a wrestler. Okay. So you but, worked uh, with you worked he, with Randy Savage? Oh it's, a lot, yeah, a lot. Oh sweet. And stuff. Yeah, a lot of matches with Randy, yeah. So and he's a tough sucker too, man, you know? Yeah. But um he uh his, his interviews are totally unique. That's what made him great. You know what I mean? Right. Now, and, and you were I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dave, right. but you know, speaking of uh, Randy Savage, because Dave and I are huge uh Ric Flair and Randy Savage fans. Those are like our like our top yeah. two guys. Um, you know, you right. were talking earlier uh, in that example of, uh, you know, that match being cut short two minutes and the wrestler couldn't bring it home. Uh, and, you, you know, you said part of this business is you got to know how to work. You got to know how to perform, call your matches when things break down. One of the things I've heard about yeah. Randy Savage is um, he scripted all of his matches. Uh, was that the case yeah. when you were dealing with him or did you or did well, you I'll call? Tell you, Go ahead. I'll tell you honestly right now, I had angles with Randy singly. I had matches like tag angles with me and Tony, the uh, grappler, too. Uh-huh. And even as dirty white boys, when we worked as the dirty white boys together, right? Yeah. Without the mask. And Memphis and all that with Lawler and Savage as tag partners and with Boogie Woogie Man and Savage as tag partners. All this stuff, we always said, here's what we're doing. Here's the finish. Go to the ring. We call it in the ring. Oh, okay. Now, awesome. I don't know what he did in WWE because I wasn't there working with him. But I guarantee another matches we had, we didn't call nothing. Okay. We called it out there. Yeah. Awesome. So I know be- yeah. before I leave this topic of promos, I-, I wanted to talk about Ox Baker. He contributed to your yeah. overall character and developed your catchphrase, didn't yeah. he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Ox did that. Ox gave me that that catchphrase. He said, Yeah, I was in Knoxville and I was supposed to be getting a big break. And I went in and I was there two weeks and they weren't pushing me and they decided they were gonna go with somebody else and this and that, and so I got booked out, but Ox, I was riding with Ox a lot, right? And Ox, I like Ox, and he goes, Lenny, you know something, you're the grappler, you're a great wrestler, he goes, but you need, he goes, I'm totally like this, you know Ox, all right? He go, uh, Lenny, you need a, you need a catchphrase, he kept saying, you need something, when you finish your promos, because he's an excellent promo guy, right? He goes, when you finish it, the people remember you by it. And I go, okay, and so he goes, we were riding that road one day. He's snapping his fingers. He goes, Roddy Piper used to do that too. He snapped his fingers and he go, he go, um, I got it. I got it, kid. I got it. I go, what is this? They got a name for you when you're the greatest wrestler in wrestling today. They don't call you a great wrestler. They call you the grappler. Beat me if you can. <laughs> I've been saying that for 30 something years. Okay? That's awesome. <laughs> That's fucking awesome, man. I better gave me that damn line I can totally to the whole thing. I couldn't believe it. Hell yeah. I wrote it down right then when he said it in the car. I wrote it down, put it in my pocket, and start using it at, next week on the interviews. I start using it. That is great, man. What, <laughs> what, what, yes. a, what a great, what a great catchphrase. What a great story. Yeah. What? Hey, so like, yeah. do you think promos nowadays, uh, I, I mean, I, I assume you watch current product and all that stuff and are they just too scripted nowadays and has the art of cutting? Well, I think them- that's the problem. You know, when here's the thing, boss, if you come to me on for your radio show and you go, I just, Hey, Lynn, Lynn, Hey, Grapple, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you about Ric Flair and I want you to go, Hey, Ric Flair, you got blonde hair and the boots <laughs> don't match. And, <laughs> yeah. and I go, wait, 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 wait. Just what, what is, what's the bullet points, okay? Right, yeah. Because I can't say verbatim. I, I never could. And a good talker usually can, okay? It's like, give me the bullet points what you want and turn the pro loose, right. okay? Because then it's going to come out from them authentically what you want anyway. But if you try, like Vince tries to put, you know direct everything they're saying, it's like reading a commercial, man, like reading a 
teleprompter. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, a lot of the times it seems like that. And, and, it, and you can tell because it, know, just, it yeah. just sounds stiff and it's st- stale. And, and Roman Reigns had a big problem with that. He's gotten better. Yeah, he only got better when he did what we're talking about here, when he just kind of cut loose and right. found his own thing. Yeah, you, you give me the bullet points and let me do my thing, and it'll come out that way. I'll hit exactly what you want on there. You know, Watts got to, Bill Watts was doing that with me when I first started, but he finally, <laughs> he finally, <laughs> oh God, up so bad. He goes, "Damn you, heck is asshole! Can you not say ain't on TV?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then one time he told me to say this, guys. He goes, he says, um, "I want you to say because they kept saying you got a loaded boot grappler. That grappler's got a loaded boot, you know, and all that thing right about my loaded boot, right? Uh-huh, of right. course." And he said. Um, he said, you, I want you to go in this interview, Bill Watts, because I want you to go in this interview, I want you to say, hey, you know something, Junkyard Dog and Boyd Pierce and all you guys are saying that I've got a load of boot. Well, that's merely conjecture. And I go, uh-huh. I'm looking at him, he goes, you don't even know what that means, do you? I go, no. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, oh, hell, just go do the interview. <laughs> I ain't, I ain't <laughs> got an idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had no idea what he's talking about. Yeah. What conjecture? Yeah. What's that got to do with old food, dude? Yeah, exactly. it, it surprised me. If, you, if your name's Cowboy Bill Watts, you shouldn't have a problem with the word ain't. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, kidding. yeah. You know, and you no probably kidding. shouldn't know the word conjecture either. Yeah, you probably shouldn't know the word conjecture. <laughs> hey, what, what, what quick. To switch gears here a little bit, Grappler, uh, uh, during your career uh, numerous times, you, you know, you uh, quote unquote got color. In other words, you know, you, you, you drew blood. Um, yeah. Does the current product, uh, you think, uh, as portrayed by the WWE, uh, does it kind of suffer because they don't draw blood or draw color as, as much as. Well, you know what I think, though? It's just like, here's how I think about it. If they did it, it would be because they ever. Here's the thing: they expose the business as entertainment, right? Yes. Okay, so now if you go out there and you bleed, everybody knows you're full of shit. Okay. Right. So I don't. I don't think it. I don't think. I think you probably should leave the blood out of it. Oh, okay. With you. Very interesting. Okay. Because I mean, in my thoughts, because unless you're going to have an MMA shoot fight out here, okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then you know, if you're going to bleed for real, do a hard way. Now, I know Harley Race used to do hard ways, and I've done a couple. Right. Now, we could do that. We could go back to that. You know, that might that might bring the business back a little bit. You it, know what I'm saying? And Brock did it. Uh, you can't find many guys like Harley Race. Yeah. You know what I mean? No. I mean, Brock Lesnar did it at Hell in a Cell. I mean, he just bashed his head into the steel post and drew blood Back's the hard way. Head, yeah, yeah. Now, there's some guys like Lesnar around you might could get, but you can't get Many of them, you know what I mean? Right. Hey, I heard Harley Race was a tough son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in Ric Flair's uh, uh, podcast interview with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Uh, do you have any any interesting Harley Race stories that you could share with our, our I'll fans? tell you an interesting one, yeah. I was, in, uh, I was booking. The first place I ever booked the territory was Kansas City for Harley Race. Uh-huh. Buck Rogley was there, and he brought us in. He quit in two weeks and left, him and, him and um, Brody. <laughs> so... I'm in Kansas City, and Harley flies all the way in from Japan, oh, okay, wow. for one night to hire me as a booker. I had no idea that's why he came in. He calls me in there by cell. He's Lenny, I want you to be my new booker. Would you like to be the booker of Kansas City? I go, it'd be an honor, sir. So he got Guy Glens to tell Guy what you said. I told Guy it would be an honor. He said, you're the new booker. I'm flying back to Japan in the morning. He goes, when I get back, you better have this damn territory on fire. <laughs> I go, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's the two things I tell you about Harley. Okay, you go say so Harley. So we're, we're booking territory, and this goes on. Everything works out, and then we used to do St. Louis too, right? With a yeah. joint show with um, um, AWA with Vern Gagne's crew, right? Yeah. Right. And then we bring the boys in from Texas from Fritz too. Well, Harley would book. We Harley would book those matches, but we booked some of our guys on the underneath card. So there was the guy that, and me and Harley was going over the card in the dressing room before the show, trying to get ready to lay things out, right? Yeah, right. And um, this guy, Scott Ferris, that was just a, a, like a, a wrestler for Kansas City office, was on the card, great big muscle-bound boy, and he, nice guy, but he liked Harley. He kept coming in there and interrupting us, and he had, have you guys ever seen a, uh, a finger wrestling board, a thumb wrestling board? Yeah. Where guys stick your thumb to it, huh? Yeah, I th- I've seen it, that a couple of times. 
You see, okay, well, he had one of them with him. He kept saying, hey, Holly, you want to try me out? And I'm sorry, he's, he smokes, Holly's smoking a cigarette. He got his boots on lace, and he's, <laughs> he's yeah. he says, hey, boy, he Scott, Scott says, go on, man, we're busy right now trying to lay out this show. So Scott left, and he come back about two more times. Kept, Holly, Holly had enough. He said, sit down, he looks at me and kind of winked. He goes, yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> Scott, Scott's a big old guy. Holly put his thumb through there, and Barry all of a sudden, sack, broke the guy's thumb. <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> Through the board. He's jumping all around. He doesn't. He said, "Now get your ass out of here and don't come back. We're busy booking the show." Uh, <laughs> okay. Take off, I was, brother. Oh, I made me sick of my stomach. He snapped it so hard. Oh. I couldn't believe it. That <laughs> always just goes back smoking. Goes okay, Lenny on the third match. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> no. where, 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 where were we, Lenny? Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> so then one time, boss, check this out. I had my own office, you know, in uh, Kansas City. Uh-huh. And uh, I was in the front office, nice desk and all. And in the back, they had a couple goggles and uh, races office in the back. And then we had two or a couple more offices there. So um, we go, they send me to, go to a fair show, way across, it's like three, 250 miles, you know. Jesus. And uh, we get out there, and it's the middle of the damn field, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's a fair. And there must have been maybe 80 people there. Oh, okay, and the God. dust is blowing, it's Kansas, and a um, limited card, okay, so they did this once a year, and I didn't realize this at the time, but they, so I wrestled in the first match, I wrestled in a tag match, and wrestled in the Battle Royal, okay? Wow. So three times I had to wrestle, and then we get out of the ring, and there ain't no shower, there ain't nothing, you got to drive all the way back, stinking, right? Yeah. And so I started getting the car, me and Tony together, uh, Grapper 2. And uh, the guy that pulls up in his Cadillac with the window down says, hey, Lindy, that's what he goes. Hey, boss, listen, will you do me a favor? I go, what? Want to watch the dishes too far I leave? Tell the wrestle uh, map. He goes, hey, smart ass. He goes, no, that, that news guy standing by the ring there, he's for the local news. I want you to go do an interview before you leave, okay? Plug in next year's show. I go, all right, I'll tonight's show. It's okay, okay. No problem. So I went over there, and I had my boots laced on my ankles, and I'm tied. And I, the guy goes, hey, uh, Mr. Grapp. I said, yes, sir. He goes, can you do me a favor? He goes, when I hit the call letters on the station, can you roll in the ring? I'll start out in the middle of the ring. You're sitting out on the outside of the ring. When I hit the call letters, will you roll in the ring, pick me up like you're going to slam me, and then spin me toward the camera, and I'll go, this is KP, whatever, TV, blah, blah, and then oh, we'll God. go out like that. And I said, no problem, no problem, man. If that's what you want. Okay. So I'm waiting like this. Brother, the first thing out of the guy's mouth is, Tony Simmons, something is, hey, folks, how are you doing? This is so and so and uh, whatever call or whatever channel. And he goes, uh, he says, Yeah, we're here at the fair. He goes, Everybody had a good time because wrestling, everybody knows wrestling steak. Oh, but back oh, then, you didn't say the you didn't say the F word back then. No. no. Okay. No. And I told Tony, I go watch this, Tony. And he goes, <laughs> Oh no. And he goes, and he says, all oh, the people had fun. They know nobody's hurting each other. And the wrestlers had fun. They were just playing around, having fun in here. And it was a great night to fair. And they, glad you, these people all came out. Hey, y'all miss you. You should have been here. And he hit, this is so-and-so started hitting the call letter, right? Yeah. Right. So I, when, when I come in, I buried the back and suplex him. Boom, knocked him out. I oh, him shit. The the head. I slapped the hell out of him as I could. And I got the mic. I said, what'd you call wrestling, boy? <laughs> hell, just, he's laying there doing a cropping. Right? <laughs> wow. On freaking on live tell on a newscast. Right on this couch. So Tony knows they're filming. I go, Tony knows go. So we got in the car and I'm laughing. <laughs> I showed that asshole. I, he makes somebody knocks out then instead of pull over there, give me a twelve pack on the way back. So we're drinking beer. I got about the second beer down and all of a sudden it dawned on me, boys. Wait a minute. This is a soul show. <laughs> oh, hell yes. Hell yes. Yeah. <laughs> Huh? Wow. You got chickens to pluck. Brother, check this out. This is a soul show they got 10 grand a year for. All of a sudden, dog going to be waiting. I got to go in the office tomorrow morning. The Harley's going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to get my ass whooped because I just lost this show for everybody. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> wow. All of a sudden, that phone turned into sweating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, that was the longest trip home ever. We got home the next morning. I had to be there at 8 o'clock. And I was in, I was in my office. And then I got to do a barely crack, guys, okay? And I see all of a sudden I hear it. I wonder, well, I hope that's not Harley. I see him go by and I notice he's carrying a brick. Carly always had a, a cowhide briefcase. I went, oh, no, that's Harley. <laughs> when he got to the back, he goes, Britain, get your ass in here. 
Oh, shit. I come back there. So I come back here. I go, hold on. Hold on. Let me explain, but I'm going to say, but let me see. He's just sitting there. He's twitching his eyes, staring at me. I said, let me explain, Holly. And I told him the whole story. Holly sat there and he took a couple putts. He goes, next time you need to break his arm and pull his eye out. <laughs> Nobody calls him. <laughs> That's all he raised that there. Uh, I went, thank God. <laughs> what, a, what a great story. You just don't use the F word. No. You just don't use that damn F word. I, I still don't use the F word. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it's predetermined. That's the word I use. Predetermined. There you go. I, there you go, Bob. I won't use the F word. So speaking of no, great, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, hell no. So speaking of great stories in your book, you, you talked about working with Brett the Hitman Hart before he was the Hitman, of course, and uh, you actually yeah. choked him out with a real dead chicken. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what happened was he was in Japan. It was that when I came in, he was in Japan. Right. When I came into Calgary, right? And so we said, well, I'm going to get up here and start knocking hell. I went to, I went to, um, uh, he came to America. I ran him out of there and he went, to, and he went to, uh, I came to Calgary and ran to Japan. What a coward. And so when he came back, coming back, I took, I told Stu, I need a chicken. I'll, I'll leave my finish on the air and I'll put a chicken around his neck. And man, what a, <laughs> we did it, right? But, um, so then finally they came in and ran us off, right? Yeah. He told me faces, run a song. I didn't know I was choking the hell out of him like that. So then he comes, he gets, he comes around, Buck, and he throws the damn chicken at me, right? And so it lands in the middle of the aisle, so I kick it. All right, guys? And it busts it open. Now, Ooh. Dutch, you all hanging out with nice. back and forth. Nice. <laughs> On the air. Jesus. So here's the classic, okay? You know, Stu, you know, the Stu Hart, all the things are Stu Hart, right? Yeah. yeah. After all that was done. I was getting through the shower. I was getting dressed. I look over there and I see Stu. He's washing that chicken in the sink. <laughs> <laughs> he's taking that turtle home to cook. <laughs> oh Jesus! We're gonna cook we that. We are doing that the man. They're just gonna take. They're gonna take it in the dungeon and cook it up, Lynn. So that's all I they're gonna. So. Jesus. I so. <laughs> so when when you worked with Brett back then, did did you see anything in him at that time that that led you to think, wow, this guy's really got something, or or was he still too yeah, green? Yeah, you know, that's true. Like you work with a lot of guys, but you know the guys you stand out with, the people respond to, like, whoa, you can just feel it. Yeah. You know, in, in the atmosphere. Right. And so you know this guy's got what it takes. You know what I mean? Right. And, and Brett was one of those guys? Worked hard. But, I mean, they worked, they did bumps, they did things way harder than other guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I also read in your book that Owen uh, had some fun with one of your bookings a couple times. And, uh, oh, I was a classic <laughs> Owen. Uh, yeah. So I never got to meet Owen when he was older. He was a kid then, you know? Yeah, and they and we we're in the dressing room, and it, I didn't know Owen liked my interviews, right? So I go in there, and you know they had me go, okay, grapple, right? The interview, and then I got a match, and I got another interview. I go, okay, right. So I did that, and then I go and sit down after my ma- interview, did the match, and another interview. So then he goes another match, and he goes another another interview. I go, damn, I didn't know. Finally, I go, hey, I think it was Wayne Hart. I go, Wayne, not Wayne, it was Bruce. It was Bruce, right? How many interviews are you gonna have me do today? He goes, what? He, goes, <laughs> he looked at the paper and Owen had been taking a pencil, erasing guys' name and write my name in there because he wanted to hear me talk some more. That's right. <laughs> That's... I can't geez, I don't took up half the show, dude. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, he he carried on that ribbing sort of nature when he got older. Any anybody we've yeah, talked to, like Jeff Jarrett or Triple H, always say that about Owen that he was just a prankster right up to the very end. Yeah, even that Dynamite Kid was one of the world wars, too. <laughs> yeah, well, what about Dynamite Kid? I see you worked with him in Canada as well. Uh, what, what were your impressions of him when you uh, initially were doing that? Dynamite was one of the toughest guys I ever met. That's he what could, I've heard. What a buck make. Unbelievable, yeah. And he was had one great, a great athlete, everything, you know, and double tough guy. And, you know, I was in Germany with him first, him and Brett. Before I came, that's how I ended up in Calgary because I've made a stint in Germany with those guys for six weeks. Right. And that's where, that's where they met me at, and that's how I got booked in Calgary. But um, he, um, Dynamite, when we on Sundays, we were off in Germany, and I would go work out with Dynamite. Man, he stretched me, put me in all kinds of old. <laughs> I mean, he was just teaching me different things, you know, right. how to protect yourself in the rain, you know. It's like, and Dynamite's thing was, honey, I'm not the biggest guy in the world. He's 5'10", same height I was, yeah, right? Yeah, similar. He goes, but you got to be able to put a hold. You, if you, you got a hold, you can put on anybody. 
that makes them submit or pass out or give up. And so whichever one works for you, learn it and learn it the best you can because you've got to put it on a 300 pound guy to a 150 pound guy. Okay. Yeah. It makes your <laughs> character believable. Got- yeah, and yeah. S- smaller true. guys like Chris Benoit did that. Smaller guys like Dean Malenko did that. So that, that I mean, the hell, that yeah. makes sense. Neville needs to do that. Neville, are you familiar with Neville, the current wrestler right now? He does that red arrow move. I uh, see. Uh, what I think, yeah. Yeah, that, that see, that's the same thing. I, he could use Dynamite Kid, me yeah, and Dave Phil, or someone that's like that because he needs missing. a hold. He's missing that badly. Yeah, he he he's doing doing too much training on the Mexican side of town, like <laughs> you were saying, just flying yeah, around. No, I hate to say it, yeah. Um, Too much loot yourself. <laughs> um, September uh, 19th, 1980, uh, Grappler, you won the Mid-South North American title from Mr. Ted DiBiase. Uh, what are your memories yeah. of that night, and what did winning that title mean to you? I was one of the greatest things ever happened to me, but here's how, what happened was the guy, uh, Bill Watts, called me that day, that morning, and he goes, hey, we're dropping that strap to you tonight. I was like, okay. Appreciate it. He goes, I want you to design the finish. I want you to come up with come up with something and call this office back. I'll give you two to three hours. Wow. Call me back. Yeah, he goes, call me back and it better draw us some money. And Ted, I want to see if you're a pro or not. Yeah, and Ted I want to see if you're a pro or not. I said, okay. Yeah. And thank God I came up with a good one. Okay. I can't even remember what it is right now, but it all worked and it all made sense at the time, psychology wise. And so he told me on the phone when I gave it to him, he said, when you go to the building, you give it to them guys. I think it was Roby was a booker there. You give it to them. You tell them that's what we're doing. I don't give a shit what they say. <laughs> tell them I said, they have to call me. We're doing the finish you just gave me. Yeah. I said, okay, so you can. Right? <laughs> okay. Well, that's sure. what Bill was, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a lot of pressure. I mean, we're going to hand the title over to you, but you got to give me a finish in two to three hours. I can only imagine. Yeah, I was, I was like 20 years old then, or 21 maybe. Man. And, 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 on, and on top of <laughs> Trial that, by fire. On top of that, this is not the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. This is super baby face, Ted DiBiase, right? Yeah. And, exactly. And yeah. So you had to come yeah. up with a plausible way to, to beat him <laughs> that, that was uh, going to satisfy Bill Watts and make the title change uh, believable, huh? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wow. Here's something I wanted to ask you. You're probably the best per- I've always wondered this, and, and you're probably the best person to ask this. When you're told yes. that you're going to drop a title and you're going to lose a title, yeah. what goes through your mind? I mean, do, do, you, do you feel any sort of like, I don't know, sadness or anything like that, like that or is it just purely business? I've always wondered this because I see it that. Is, actually, if you're, if you're a good enough worker, sometimes you, you don't have to have a belt. But the other thing is, a lot of times they would do that, and you know it's like uh, the sadness for me. My problem because I ain't got I'm losing the belt would be because I just got figured out of the program and I'm fixing to get my notice. Ah, <laughs> yeah. So that, I'm like, gosh, what's going on here, man? Why am I dropping this? Because maybe they're bringing somebody else, and you start wondering. That's where you start wondering. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I, I just yeah. I've, I've watched these guys like, and they're you know sometimes they'll just toss the belt to the ref and then they go and lose the belt, and I've always wondered. Did they even think about that when they're throwing the belt away as well? That's the last time I'm going to have that for a while. Does that ever enter their minds, or, or, or do you have any? Uh, well, any... They, you know, that, that's what the, the thing is that a lot of guys don't have the psychology. They don't know, okay, winning that belt is supposed to be a prestigious thing. Right. Of course. So if you, you know, prestigious is you make it and portray it on TV. Right. If you make it, throw it down like it ain't nothing, it don't mean nothing to nobody else either. Right. That's why. They don't know how to get stuff over, bosses. They want train property, a lot of them, you know? Yeah, I, I hear well, you. Well, hell, that's kind of like when you look at how, you know, the WCW's decline. Towards the later days of WCW, that title didn't mean shit. David Arquette had yeah. it. I mean, David yeah. Arquette had it. They would just throw it around. Hogan came down strumming it like a guitar. It was like, shit, what's the value of this thing? Yeah, like it, was, like it don't mean anything, yeah. Yeah. Right. You know? Right. Oh, here we go, Dave. Do you want to ask? Mean, yes. Do you want to ask, or I'll I'll let you right. lead on this. So, so the the, the birth of the DDT, and and uh, I, I read it in your book, and uh, so it, you and Jake Roberts were working a match, and uh, you guys got really sweaty. And, and why don't you tell the people yeah. listening who haven't read your book, how was the DDT that Jake Roberts developed actually born? Well, so my mom told you once at the top of the marquee grappler, you got to go 30 to 40 minutes every night. Right. right? Yeah. Okay. Mid South. So I'm wrestling every night. Now, what now? It's in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I'm wrestling. 
can't get the snake robbers. It's like 100 outside, okay? It's, even with air it's, it's so hot in the building. And so I'm going, I'm in like number, like 35 minutes into the match. And we were doing a front face lock. Every time I call a spot and Jake go back to the front face lock and take me down, work me down to the mat, to the mat. I work my way back up. <laughs> we're fighting and going back and forth. We got the people going good. And so I called the spot, and when he went to grab the front face out, both our feet slipped out of the and down went straight down, head first. Right. Boom! It just like a DDT. He fell on his butt. I fell face down on my stomach. <laughs> it was a DDT, and the people popped. I said, Jake, you hear that, brother? He goes, damn, yeah. So I go, let's do it again. So I called the spot out of it. I said, then snatch me and do it. He's okay. This time, knowing Jake, with it, <laughs> kind of person he is, he has to slap me on the back to make it even harder, right? Right. Of course. Wow. And so that popped. As we hit, and the people really come unglued, right? So then we went on and finished the match and everything. And so uh, at TV, the next Saturday, they said, Jake, you need to use that for a finish, bro, and I'll be using it around the loop for stocks. Right. And so that's when Jake got in his head and he used it for a finish on TV, and, and all the boys went, whoa, dude, that was good. What, what is that? He goes, it's a DDT. Wow. <laughs> he did DDT, and it took off from there, and he started using it for a finish. Do you think it's kind of ironic how the move has come full circle, where it went from the most feared finisher in all of pro wrestling to now it's back to being a high spot move, like what it was when you and Jake yeah, stumbled I, on it? They got a bunch of different versions, and they use it for a high spot now. I yeah, know. Yeah, it, I mean... It, <laughs> tornado ddts and all this stuff off the top rope i mean it, it's it's become a transitional it move seldom puts anyone away though no, these days yeah yeah i know bro i know i yeah i don't know they they always they always something gets smothered so that way they, they, they kept it unique it means so much more right you know what i mean right of course right they, they, think, they always somebody add something to this to that and all kinds of things it'll always be that way <laughs> i got you hey you know uh there was a st- I remember the first time the guy did Super Destroy. I mean, uh, yeah, Super Destroy Scott Irwin. Remember him? Oh, yeah. Okay. He, he was my partner way back, okay? And Scott was the hell of a guy. And he's the first guy that did the superplex off the top row. Right, right. And well, now he was your tag team partner the night you beat um, Andre the Giant and Dusty well, Rhodes. Yes, he was. Yes, yes, in the Superdome. Yeah. And you also beat uh, Junkyard Dog and Dick Murdoch in the finals of that tournament, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that mm-hmm. that has to be. I mean, God, just thinking of uh, that was the, a classic in my career. Believe me, yeah, I'm like, whoa, you guys yeah. actually going over? <laughs> you guys, you guys beat an entire Hall of Fame class in one night. I know, but <laughs> how was it? How was it going over on Andre the Giant? Well, well, we beat Dusty, but still we won the match, right? But you know, some guys. I'm gonna tell you, Andre was one hell of a guy. He was one hell of a worker. I'll tell you, for example. We were in a spot show, me and Murdoch and Bob Orton Jr. in a six-man tag, right? Right. With uh, uh, Andre the Giant, Junkyard Dog, and Paul Orndorff, okay? Wow. Now, wow. the place is packed because Andre never goes around these small towns. So when he does, everybody and their brother comes out to see Andre the Giant, right? And so, I mean, there ain't a place to sit in, in the is sold out, right? Of course. And so uh, we go out, with, I'm doing high spots, and Dickie's doing Faye Murdoch and Orton Jr., Putting the bait faces over, you know, and then finally, um, I, I said, it's okay, let's get some heat, you know, get, start to get some heat on them. One up. So I get on up, I hit him, he hits me back. So I kick him, he kicks me back. I, I blind him, he blinds me back. I go, damn, tag dog, man. He won't sell nothing. Right? <laughs> so, dog, yeah, so the dog comes in, and the same thing. I hit, I blind him, he head busts me twice. <laughs> I kick him in the nut. I mean, below below the belt. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. He don't even sell it. He don't even sell it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and he head busts me again. I finally, I go, man. All of a sudden, we hear this. Andre goes, tag me in, boss. <laughs> He's pissed. Right. Dog tags in Andre. Andre back me in the corner. He goes, Lenny, load the boot and kick me in the gut. <laughs> I load the boot, <laughs> kick me in the gut. He went down. So we got heat on Andre. <laughs> Can you imagine that? How the hell you get Andre down, but Junkyard Dog you can't get down? You can't. They, they, felt, like, they felt so bad after the match because he embarrassed them. Okay? <laughs> but they should have because he shoved it. They don't want to sit all the way. So little dude kicked me in the gut. Yeah. He went down and went, whoa, and the people got quiet. <laughs> I thought we have a right. <laughs> yeah, I heard. He I heard. beating the horn and taking turns, and then he made the hot tag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Unbelievable. I heard on another interview. On, uh, I heard another interview on YouTube when you uh, relayed the story that you know Andre called them all prima donnas or something like that. Well, he did. He got pissed at him. He was mad as hell. Yeah. <laughs> Here, what we really want to blame him. What, what we really want to know, Lenny, is is did you ever go drinking with Andre? <laughs> Here we go. Oh my God! I'm <laughs> Are the I stories true? Yes, they're all true. I got nightmares over it still. He must, oh, bro. <laughs> the one time I tried to hide from Andre, he caught me over Black Bart's uh, trailer house, right? <laughs> I was in bed in my underwear, and he came in, and he, he could only stick his body through the doorway of the trailer, okay? He turned the mattress over me, and when I got up, he chopped me back over the mattress. <laughs> wow. I said, let me get my pants on there. I'll be with you just a minute. And he got me in the car. We went over him and Doug Robley, and we went after I was in Baton Rouge. And brother, he, he about killed me, making me drink. Oh, he said, don't you ever run from me, boy. Well, <laughs> man, I heard that guy could freaking just uh, can, barrel. Could close down a freaking bar. A barrel. Oh, boy, he can drink a bar. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. It's unbelievable. Hey, uh, what, we know when the Grapplers uh, tag team was formed with Tony Anthony, you know, they had Jimmy Hart and uh, Jim Cornette as managers. You know, what was it like? Yeah. To, what was it like? Because uh, we haven't really talked about managers at all in this interview. What was it like to work with, uh, you know, Jimmy Hart and Jim Cornette? I mean, you know, having those two guys as mouthpieces, uh, that had to be, <laughs> had to have significance. It is cool. I mean, you guys, you know, both those guys deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, man. And they, and, um, Especially Jimmy Hart and, and Cornette, too. I love Cornette. But he, I was like, hey, guys, can I get some of the promo? Yeah. <laughs> they're, both, they're both fantastic talkers. I mean, what are you going to say? That's like, <laughs> unbelievable. But, no, those guys are pros. And Jimmy, Jimmy, he, he pushed for us all the time. He liked us, you know, Jimmy Hart and stuff. And it was an honor to present him in the Carl Pride Alley this year. I gave him an award. And it was an honor to do that. <laughs> Jimmy Hart. <laughs> Jimmy he was one of the and Cornette's just I mean I don't know if there's been too many better than him maybe maybe Bobby Heenan that's the only one I can really Jim Cornette's a legend yeah, man pretty good though man Cornette's really good man yeah he really <laughs> is so like um you know managers aren't really used with much effectiveness any longer do you do you think that's a a, a problem with the current product do you think like there's a place for managers like there used to be. Well, in a in a certain in a certain situation, I, I don't know like it used to be because it's more like now they know the guys not paying the guys. The guys not they 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 know so much more about the entertainment side of it. Right. You know, with the internet and all that stuff going on, it's hard to keep paid stuff and not to work something like that too well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what do you think of the job Paul Heyman's doing as Brock Lesnar's advocate? You know, I really haven't watched too much of that. I honestly, boss, right. I've seen some of Paul. Uh, yeah, you know, but I don't really have much, much of an opinion on why I haven't watched much of his stuff. Yeah, Paul draws a lot of heat on himself without ever getting involved in the matches, just <laughs> by being a talker. Yeah. So, oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, Lenny, I don't, I don't want to keep you on too much longer because you've given us a lot of your time already. But I did want to ask oh, you real yeah. quick. Um, this yeah. last year, 2015, we lost an entire Hall of Fame class. Yeah. Because uh, we lost Vern Gagne, Tommy Richard, Tommy Rogers, excuse me, Nick Bockwinkle, yeah. Dusty Rhodes, and Roddy Piper. Um, can you yeah. share with us some memories of those guys that perhaps you haven't told before? Well, uh, the only thing I get, well, especially Roddy Piper, I can. Okay, now Vern Gagne, I wasn't around him that much. Okay, uh, Bobby, uh, Tommy Rogers, I was around a lot. He was one hell of a nice guy. You couldn't find a more friendly guy and a friend. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. He was always upbeat. He was always your friend. And he was always the same guy every time you seen him. Okay. Dusty, you, I, what can I say? Dusty was a total pro. Okay. He was a pro. He knew his business inside and out. Dusty helped me many, many times as well. Plus, we had great matches together. And I love Dusty from Texas. He's a good man. Me and him always got along. You know what I mean? Real good. He, he, tried, um, to, he tried to get you to stop from uh, from leaving Bill Watts' territory. Oh, yeah. He says, man, what are you doing giving your notice, kid? You know what I mean? You know how many guys made three thousand dollars and they're twenty one years old? <laughs> I said I don't care. He goes, Well maybe one day you will. <laughs> yeah. He I was, was too big a ego. I was too too I knew too much more britches back in. Yeah. I wanted to have it <laughs> Dusty tried to tell me, but I wouldn't listen. Yeah. But uh, as far as uh, Roddy Piper goes, me and Roddy were really close, close knit friends and um Roddy uh was like this. He was the type guy that 
honestly, folks, I mean, family came first to Roddy Piper. Right. And I always respect him and, and appreciate him for that. I mean, he was, a, he was a money maker. He was a good athlete. He was a fantastic, uh, uh, one of the best workers ever. And I've been in some talkers. And, uh, but he was family came first to him. And I admire him for that. I got to ask you one thing. This is a surprise to Gates. He doesn't know I'm asking, I'm asking you this, Lenny. But yeah. it's in your yeah. book that when you were coming up, you were working at some place with a, a guy who eventually turned into Randy Travis. And Gates oh. is a huge yeah, country music fan. Do you have any Randy Travis stories that you can share with us? Uh, the only way, yeah. Well, his name was Randy Trawick. That's what his right. name is. Right. And before he was like 17... And he couldn't even come in, or 17 years old, in the bar called Country City, USA, down in Charlotte, North Carolina, when I was working, when I was, you know, young, you know. I think I was 19. But I had a full beard now. I thought I was 21. And, and I was one of the rest. They let me in there free. <laughs> so we get in there, and we drink, we drink in this bar, Country City, USA, and we'd make it back. And uh, every week, every week, uh, Randy was playing there, but he had to sit in the kitchen because he was too young. They couldn't let him in the bar, right? right. Okay. And so, uh, Randy, I'm going to sit back there and talk to him because he's the only guy my age. Rest some guys are way older than me, you know? <laughs> so, he, <laughs> so he only knew it, not the rest of them. But me and Randy got along good. And then I used to come in there, of course, where I'd be lit up. And sometimes he'd be on stage. I'd be up on stage trying to pick him up like I'm going to body slam him okay. and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he go all oh, those crazy wrestlers are here again, and so, so I'm I'm in Texas, like you know, two or three years later, and I I'm coming home from the gym, and I'm, I'm in the summer, and I got the music playing, and I, I hear this guy singing, I go, damn, that sounds like Randy, and I, for sure enough, it said Randy uh, Travis, I go, Randy Travis, then I find out it's Randy Travis, then he came to Gillies Club, and then I went to Gillies Club, I went down to the scene backstage and we got along real good but yeah i, I know randy real well back then we we had fun that's fantastic <laughs> we had some fun. i just i I, wanted... I used to body slam that guy on stage that's a great story yeah, I, just, I, I... I wish i got him at the grand old opera <laughs> <laughs> gates you got anything to ask lynn before we uh, let him go here uh no sir lynn all i can say is man thank you for coming on once again legitimizing wow. us jobbers and uh it's been it's been nothing but a pleasure yeah, Lenny, I, Buddy, thank you for both you guys. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got so much more we could ask you, but we've already kept you on for an hour, and I, I'd really love to have you back on the show sometime in the future if you'd be willing to come on and, and talk maybe the second half of the book. There's a lot more stuff to cover. Anytime you want to, fellas. Just, all you got, all you got is only, if you want me back on, all you got to do is keep plugging. Hey, you can get that book, uh, Memoirs of a Mass Madman to Grapp Ourselves. Um, uh, uh, com. <laughs> yeah, and and it's and I'll add it's available on Amazon too, so uh, you can get yes, it. I'm sorry. No, no, no. We'll no, we'll we'll, no, we'll, no, we'll share that. We'll share that on both of our Twitter accounts, on the Facebook, on the Instagram. We'll pimp you out. We'll yeah, pimp yeah. the book out. Is there uh, any other? My boys, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yes, no, sir. we appreciate yeah, it, man. Lynn, thank you very much, so much, and we'll right. we'll be in touch with I'd you. I'd be glad to be on any time. You know that. You just call back when you're ready. Thanks, Lenny. Okay. All right. All right, guys. That was our interview with the one and only grappler, Len Denton. Gates, I know I don't really have to ask you what you thought of this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What would you think of that interview? Uh, fuck. Hey, Gator. <laughs> hey, Gator. Did you enjoy that interview? Does a bear shit in the woods, Dave? I Does mean, a duck quack? Yeah, he he freaking killed it. I mean, like, like I said at the onset of that interview, you heard stories. I heard stories that I haven't heard anywhere else on the uh, on the web about wrestlers. Len Denton's a fantastic dude. The guy speaks our language. I love his, you know, down-home, good old boy style. That's just what we could relate to I down here in like Bakersfield. I he'd like the shine. Len Denton would probably, the grappler would love to sip some apple pie moonshine with uh, Dave and old Gator. You know that he would yeah you know Denton would love to sip I, I mean that was a great interview though man we even got a freaking randy travis story thank we did. you thank you yeah, I, I i sprang that on you as a surprise a late merry christmas because i had read len's book and guys by the way i mean yeah we're gonna plug the shit out of it buy the book it's a fantastic read one of the best wrestling books you'll ever read grappler memories of a masked madman on his site grapplerbook.com you can get it i got it on my kindle wherever you get it just get it uh, co-authored by uh, I'm trying to pronounce Joe's name Joe Vithiathil 
I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't know how to pronounce Joe it. Joe Vithia. But Joe, thank you so much. Joe worked with me to set up that interview with Lynn Denton. And uh, Joe, thank you so much for setting it up. Joe did a great job co-authoring the book. Yeah, I mean, what can you say about this interview, guys? We covered everything. I mean, the guy basically told, I'll take your money, but you ain't never going to make a dime off it, boy. And he says, fuck you, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Abdullah the Butcher. Of all the people to be an inspiration, Abdullah the Butcher to Abdullah offer the damn butcher. advice. I mean, it, uh, lots of stories about Cowboy Bill Watts, a very polarizing figure. Some people love him. Some people hate him. You heard uh, Lenny's... Uh, Comments about that. I mean, without Bill Watts, the grappler would have never come to pass. Um, you know, how the grappler came to be, learning to cut a promo from his dad, from the one and only nature boy, Ric Flair, Ox Baker, talking about Macho Man Randy Savage. Surprised me by saying that he doesn't think that WWE needs more color because everybody knows it's a work now. That really surprised me. He threw me a curve on that. I, I thought he would be like, you know, hardcore, like, oh, yeah, you need a lot of blood. But he raises a really good point, though, and one that I honestly had not thought of that before. But yeah. Y'all know it's fake, not fake, a work. You can't use the F word. As I told him earlier, we would not use the F word, and I don't use the F word. But I know people will sit there and say, well, it's fake. Why would you bleed? You know, He raises a good point. You know that it's sports entertainment. Why are you going to bleed? Interesting perspective. It was. Different. I, I was surprised. Yeah. But yeah, we got stories about uh, Dynamite Kid, about Brett the Hitman Hart, the story about Owen changing up the booking to get more interviews out of out of Lynn. Oh, mischievous kid, man. That's straight from the from his book. What uh, a fan to have too early on. Yeah, have Owen Hart as your as yeah. your fan. Uh, the night he won the title from DiBiase, the birth of the DDT. I mean, just so much stuff. Memories about Dusty. The birth of the DDT. We had on this program the Where, co-creator of the DDT with the legendary Jake, the freaking Snake Roberts. Yeah. Talking about Jim Cornette, Jimmy Hart. I mean, memories about Dusty Rhodes, Roddy. P I mean, just Harley Race. I love Harley the stories Race. about Harley Race. Yeah, just all around, just a great. Uh, I mean, I cannot thank the grappler Len Denton enough for coming on the show and spending an hour legitimizing a couple of carpenters. Yeah, as you learned I'm from the interview, carpenter. not jobbers. We're carpenters now because uh, we're building, laying this that foundation for more jobbers to come. <laughs> Cooking up the audio dope, laying Cooking the foundation. <laughs> All that stuff. So, yeah, again, a huge, massive thank you to Len, the grappler Denton, for coming on the show and spending over an hour talking to us about his career, his experiences, stories about some of the greatest of all time. I got nothing more to add to that, my man. Nor do I. An epic show. Worthy of a standalone episode standing on its own. That's mm -hmm. kind of redundant. But, hey, it is what it is. But that is our 63rd episode of the Attitude of Aggression Wrestling Podcast, a tremendous Interview with Len the Grappler Denton. Um, the plan is we will be back later on this week to recap the week that was. We know Raw is going on right now as we speak. Uh, who knows how that's going to turn out? I'm sure that Roman's going to somehow win. Don't who let knows anybody... how raw we're going to get? How raw are we going to get? Ah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I know we're out of control. So, uh, but yeah, we're going to come back later on, probably Thursday night, do the week in review recap Raw. Uh, part two of the NXT best of 2015. Uh, see what Corey Graves and uh, and uh, and Rich Brennan are talking about. See what happens on the first edition of SmackDown on the USA Network this week. Uh, I imagine they're gonna be pulling out some major stops for that thing, wouldn't you think, Mr. Gator? I'd imagine so. So we will have all of that for you. New year, new me. Yeah, exactly. Coming your way Thursday night. But let's give you folks contact information if you've listened to this show, this episode specifically for Len Denton. And this is the first time you've ever listened to our podcast. Uh, we have not gotten into much buffoonery tonight because we're dedicating this episode strictly to Len and uh, giving him the forum that he so richly deserves. And we haven't gone completely crazy yet. Just one shot of the booze tonight. Yeah. But if you like what you hear, <laughs> if you like what you hear and you want to contact the show with any questions, you want to answer hot tag topics. Let's say you're going back and listening to all the episodes. Like, God, these guys are great. I want to answer some of these hot tag topics. You want to, you want, if you're a sponsor and you want to be on the show, you want to pay us to advertise your product. We'll do it. We will pimp out anything on this program. Anything. anything. Absolutely anything. For cheap. For very cheap. Very cheap. We're, We're for sale. We're horse. We're for sale. Yeah. I am I am for sale, all of it. God knows that. God damn, you know that's yeah, everything's right. Everything's got a price tag. It does. So yeah. uh, you send an email to attitudeofaggression at gmail.com. Once again, attitudeofaggression at gmail.com. Uh, if you go to the website, www.attitudeofaggression.com, this is a nice one-stop shop because it's got all the podcast episodes, the blog posts, 
up at the top of the web page or near the top, it's got our social media bar, which has all the logos for all the social media, email, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, your mom, everything in between, you know, stuff like that. Well, maybe not a link to your mom. Come but, on yeah, now. You, you might have one. Link you to know. YouTube too. You never know. So anyway, um, the website's a good one-stop shop. On Facebook, facebook.com slash attitude of aggression. Please hit the like button, Ygates. Because we like you the likes. We like them all. A whole lot. lot. Jerry Briscoe's the hardcore champion. Holy shit. <laughs> I actually watched that after we recorded that to make sure I got that right. They did. They whispered the announcement of the title change. So epic. Jerry Briscoe, what a beast. I know. Hardcore champion. Um, on Twitter, we are at Attitude Ag. That is at, edit, at Attitude A-G-G. Please go there, hit the follow button, follow us so you can keep up to date with all. We like the follows, too. We do. All of the Attitude of uh, Aggression-related stuff. Gates, there's an alternate Twitter handle. What is that address? Old Gator, O-L-E underscore Gator, G-A-T-O-R. That is the alternative email, as the alternative Twitter. And real. Yeah. Rest in peace. And catch old Gator on Instagram too. Yeah. O L uh O L underscore Gator, but it's just O L, not O L E. Oh, you changed it. It's Instagram. not your name anymore. No, it's just old Gator. Okay. I gotta protect. I gotta protect. Uh, I can't implicate my name in any of this mess that we do. <laughs> After I've been pimping it for the last yeah, couple of weeks. You know, they need to know my old Gator. They know my government name. It's over. <laughs> the government lied about 9-11 gorilla. They lied. O-L underscore G-A-T-O-R on Instagram, and I am very active as far as our uh, as far as our postings there. Uh, the other one, the the official uh, Instagram account is at Attitude of Aggression. Uh, so you can go to Instagram, check that thing out. On Pinterest, we're at Pinterest.com. Do a search for Attitude of Aggression. You can find the uh, posts, pictures, articles, things like that that we find fun and interesting. There are some of them. Most of them are there on Pinterest. Um, the YouTube channel, um, as we've mentioned before, it's a little hit and miss if you do a search for it. So what I did was I put a link for it on the website. So I would suggest if you want to check out the YouTube channel, check out the playlist that Gates is creating. And Go, we're always creating new ones. We're always working always, on new ones. We're always yeah. working on and we're going to get that original content. We've been promising it. It's coming. Um, but the best way to do it, the easiest way, go to the website, hit the YouTube logo. It'll take you right there. Yeah. That's the easiest way to do it. And then on Google+, Plus, if you want to go there and do a search for Attitude of Aggression, hit the plus button, become a member of the inner circle of Attitude of aggression Aholic. Be an aggression Aholic. Do it. It's a good time. It's a fun time. It's a, it's a great time. So that's going to bring us to an end uh, to episode 63, a very you know short shorter episode, but probably one of the most important ones we've ever done because we got to talk to the grappler. I love some of the questions you asked him. Hey, grappler. I got a question for you. (laughs) I thought that was great. So once again, a massively huge thank you and shout out to the one and only grappler, Len Denton, for coming on the show, being a part of the show. We cannot appreciate, we cannot express enough, sir, how much we appreciate you putting over a couple of carpenters. A couple of carpenters like us. Very much appreciated. And we look forward to having Len Denton back on the show in the near future to cover really the second part of his book because we really What's only... What's that book again? It is, once again, I got to remember the dang name of this, Grappler, Memoirs of a Masked Madman. Did I get it right, Gates? Grappler, Memoirs of a Masked Madman. I got I to gotta read that again. Here it is. I got it. Yeah. Grappler, Grappler, Memoirs of a Masked Madman. Len Denton. Co-author of that, well, along with our friend Joe Vithiathil. I God, I hope I didn't butcher that name too bad. That's a tough one. But by all means, guys, go get that book. Read it. Download it. Consume it however you want to. It's a fantastic read. You will plow through it. There is so much. If you are a wrestling historian, Phil White, the lone wolf, we're talking to you. Um, if you're a wrestling historian, this is a must read. You got to read this. It is one of the easiest reads you will get. And it's one of the best reads, uh, one of the best wrestling books I've ever read, bar none. Fantastic stuff. So much information. Anything to add, Gates? Nope. All right, guys. That brings us to an end of episode 63. Until next time, wrestling fans, you stay aggressive and you do it with attitude. We'll see you later on this week to review the rest of the world of pro wrestling. So long. <laughs>